Doc, you're a great man, and you're not going to suffer for something you didn't do. Frank, you promised not to tell that story. But I didn't promise not to find the real thief, and that's just what I'm going to do. Maybe you can help. NBC presents The Adventures of Frank Berrywell. There it is, an echo of the past. An exciting past, a romantic past. The era of the horse and carriage, gaslit streets, and free-for-all football games. The era of one of the most beloved heroes of American fiction, Frank Merriwell. Merriwell is loved as much today as ever he was, and so the National Broadcasting Company brings him to radio in a brand new series of stories adapted from the famous books by Bert L. Standish. Today, The Clue of the Numbers, or... Justice Triumphant. It's nine o'clock in the evening as Frank Merriwell drives into Burridge home from the football rally. A chill October rain has been falling, and the darkened cobblestone street is shrouded in mist. And as the dark bulk of the Yale Athletic Office looms through the fog ahead, Inza turns to her silent companion. What's wrong, Frank? You've hardly spoken a word to me since we left the rally. I'm sorry, and so I've been thinking about something. <laughs> You're not worried about the darkness game, are you? No, it isn't that. It's just... Well, did you notice anything peculiar about the rally tonight? No. It's just like any other football rally. A lot of noise and a lot of fun. Yes, but someone was missing. Who, Frank? I thought all the team was there. All but Herb Childs. He didn't show up all evening. That's right. He wasn't there, was he? And it's strange. He likes excitement. That's his trouble. He might be in some sort of jam. We certainly couldn't afford to lose him for the game. Oh, Frank, you're just borrowing trouble. Herb's probably asleep in his room right now. Oh, I hope so, Inza. Sorry I've been such bad company. Oh, you haven't at all. I just don't like to see you worry. And speaking of worrying, if we don't get to my house soon, my uncle's going to begin to wonder where I am. Oh, we're almost there. See, there's the Athletic Association now. Oh, yes, of course. It's so hard to get your bearings in this fog. <laughs> oh, Goodness, what was that? An explosion, and it came from the athletic office. I saw the flash. Whoa, boys. Whoa, whoa. Oh, I wonder what happened. I'll find out. Here ends it. Take the reins. All right, Frank. Be careful, Frank. I will. Oh, it's locked. I have to break in. I hope there's no fire. try to get up yet. I'm... I'm all right now. I... I can get up. What happened, Frank? Someone hit me from behind. I couldn't see who it was. I saw someone run out the door. You did? Who was it? I couldn't see that well in the fog. Could you tell anything about him at all? Yes, Frank. I... I could. What? He was a short, husky man in a white sweater. He had a black baseball cap pulled down over his eyes. But that sounds like... Yes, Frank. Like the football trainer. Oh, you must be mistaken, Enza. Doc Roberts wouldn't do a thing like that. Which way did he go? Up the street, toward the field house. Well, there's no use chasing him now in this fog. But what would Doc Roberts be doing here at this time of night? Why would he hit me? Here, Frank, let me look at your head. That blow might have cut you. Oh, never mind that now, Enza. Let me have the lantern. I want to find out about that explosion. Are you sure it was here in the office? Nothing seems to be damaged. Nothing but the safe over here. Frank. Blown wide open. Oh, but all the athletic funds are in that safe. Where, Enza? They're not there now. The safe has been stripped of everything. Frank, listen. Someone's coming down the wall. Maybe it's the man in the white sweater. Stand over there in the corner, Enza. I'll right. throw my coat over the lantern. Who's in here? Why, it's Mr. Kirby, the treasurer. What could he be doing around here now? We'll soon find out. Mr. Kirby, it's Frank Merriwell and Enza Burridge. Oh. What? What's happened here? I'll turn up the lantern and let you see for yourself. There. Why, Mr. Kirby, what's the matter? You're pale as a ghost and covered with mud. I... I had an accident up the road away. An accident? Yes. And a mighty strange one, too. What happened? Well, I was driving home from the railroad station. I went down to meet the dean who was supposed to arrive on the 857. The train's two hours late. There's a washout up the line. So you didn't wait, and you had an accident on the way back. That's right. On the road out there, just below the field house, somebody in a white sweater ran right in front of my horse. 
I pulled the rein so hard to keep from running him down that my horse reared and turned the buggy over into the ditch. But how did you happen to come here? I saw your light and I came to investigate. Well, I'm glad you came, Mr. Kirby. Look at that safe. Why, it's, it's been blown open. Yes, and all the athletic funds stolen. No. But just this afternoon, I put the ticket money for the Dartmouth game in there. Oh, this is terrible. As treasurer of the Athletic Association, I'm responsible for that money. Yes, sir, I know, but what bothers me is how the thief got in. Did you lock all the doors when you left this evening, Mr. Kirby? With all that money in there, of course. I was particularly careful to lock up. Well, the front door was certainly locked. I had to break it in. Inza saw the thief run out this side door. Let's see if it's been forced. Well, it must have been. I'm positive I locked it when I left. No. No, the door hasn't been forced. That means someone had a key. Wait. What's this? What is it, Frank? A strand of wool caught in the door frame. White wool. White wool? Is that significant? I'm afraid it fits in perfectly with what Enza saw. Yes, the man I saw running away wore a white sweater. I'm positive of that. But that sounds like the man who frightened my horse. What do you make of this, Merriwell? You know who it was? I, I wish I could answer no to that, but I'm afraid it sounds very much... Frank, li- someone else is coming up the walk. Yes, I hear them. It's too dark out there to tell who it is. Is there some trouble in there? Why, that sounds like Joe Nugent's voice. Who's Joe Nugent? The baggage agent down at the station. He lives near here, I believe. I noticed the door broken down and thought maybe something was the matter. Something is. There's been a robbery. A, a robbery? Where? Someone blew open the safe, Joe, about 40 minutes ago. You didn't see anything suspicious, did you? Oh, my no. I was down at the station then, handling the baggage for the evening train. I just got through now, and I was walking home when I saw your light. Thought maybe I could help out some. Well, thanks just the same. I'm afraid there's nothing anyone can do now until the authorities are notified. Well, uh, I'll take care of that, Merriwell. As treasurer, it's my responsibility. Well, perhaps Inza and I should go along. She saw the man, you know. Well, that won't be necessary until morning. I must see the dean anyhow, so I'll go over to his house and wait for him to get home. Well, all right, Mr. Kirby, just as you like. I'll take Enza home. Yes, my uncle's going to be worried. And Mary will. Yes. I wouldn't trouble myself with this matter any further, if I were you. You better get your rest. The Dartmouth game's coming up, you know. Bart! Oh, hello, Frank. Did you just get in? It's a nasty night out, isn't it? Bart, kick off those house slippers and get into a pair of shoes. Why? What's up? There's been some trouble over at the athletic office. I think Doc Roberts may be in a pretty bad jam. Doc in trouble? What's it all about? I'll tell you on the way over. We're going to Doc's house right now. I certainly hope Doc is home. Yes? Good evening. Is Mr. Roberts at home? No, I'm sorry. He is... Aren't you his housekeeper? Yes, I am. Well, I'm Frank Merriwell, and this is Bart Hodge. We're sorry to disturb you this late at night, but uh, do you have any idea where we could find Mr. Roberts? It's very important. No, boys, I couldn't say. He didn't tell me where he was going. When did he leave? Well, let me see now. It must have been around 7 o'clock when he left the house. And he hasn't been home in the meantime? No, not that I know of. Well, thanks anyhow. Would you like to leave a message for him? No, I guess not. We'll see him first thing in the morning. Good night. Thank you. Good night, boys. Oh, gosh, Frank, it looks bad for Doc Roberts. He's been out all evening. Unless he can prove he was somewhere else tonight at nine. Yeah, but what about the other evidence? The man was dressed like Doc, and he was seen going to the field house. Do you suppose he did rob that safe, Frank? Oh, I'm sure he didn't. Not Doc. After all, he doesn't own the only white sweater in New Haven. Could have been someone else in another sweater. Yeah, but how could he prove that? Maybe we can prove it. Too late to do anything more tonight, but first thing in the morning, before class, we'll drop over at the field house. I'd like to have a look at Doc's sweater. Well, we got here early enough, Bart. No one could have disturbed anything yet. Oh, not much chance of finding a clue in this hodgepodge of clothes and athletic equipment. Well, first, let's see if Doc Roberts' white sweater is hanging on his usual hook. Yes, there it is. Good. All right, let's have a look at it. I hope this will teach Roberts to keep his stuff in a locker. Hey! Bart, look at this. What? A piece of wool's been torn out of the sleeve. Sure enough. Let's see if this piece we found in the athletic office last night matches up. Uh, There's no doubt about it, Frank. It matches all right. That means the thief wore this sweater. Uh, We'd better get over to see Roberts right away. Hold on a minute, Bart. Let's make sure we haven't overlooked anything else here. All right. Everything seems to be as usual, though. Not quite. What do you mean, Frank? Those crumpled newspapers in the corner. Well, Roberts always stacks the sports sections in that corner, Frank. You know that. Yes, but they're always in a neat pile, not crumpled up like this. And, and these aren't just sports sections. They're entire newspapers. 
Oh, wait a minute. What is it, Frank? This row of figures written on the margin of the paper. Oh. Mm. 740, 1150, 246, 539, 857. Well, they don't make any sense to me. Me either. Say, maybe there could be some new football signals the coach gave Roberts. Mm, that makes sense. Roberts probably wanted them handy for our scrimmage today. Well, in that case, why should he crumple them up and throw them in the corner? Well, you tell me. I can't figure it out, Bart. Well, I'll just take this paper with me. There's just a chance these numbers mean something else. You boys looking for something? Who's that? Just Captain Burns, boys, the oh. chief of police. Oh, hello, chief. A little early for you two to be in the field house? Well, yes, sir, I guess it is. Playing detective, eh? I know you, Mary Well. You're quite a football player, but this isn't a football game. This is a serious business. I advise you to keep out of it. We didn't mean to interfere, Chief Burns. It's just that we don't want Doc Roberts accused of something he didn't do. Why are you so sure he's innocent? Because we know Doc Roberts, that's all. Mm, very touching, boys, very touching. But in that case, you'll be sorry to hear that I'm on my way over to see Dean Clark right now. I'm going to recommend that Doc Roberts be arrested for grand larceny. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chief Burns, but I simply can't conceive of a man like Mr. Roberts committing such a crime. Well, I know how you feel, Dean Clark, but there's the evidence. I've checked every point. He can't account for his whereabouts at the time of the crime, and he was seen by two witnesses on the scene. Now, what more do you want? Well, but as I understand it, neither Miss Burridge nor Mr. Kirby will make a positive identification. It's strong enough for any jury. The build of the man fits the description of Roberts, and I examined his sweater at the field house. It was worn in the rain that night. Yes, ma'am, but what of the motive? That much money is motive enough for anyone, Dean Clark. And one more point. Roberts is one of the four people who have a key to that side door. The other three are the student manager, Jack Mason, Mr. Kirby, and yourself. I see. Well, Chief, what do you want me to do about it? Just prefer charges, Dean Clark, and I'll arrest him. Well, you must give me a little time to think that over, Chief Burns. This is a serious step. All right, Dean, but don't take too long. This case has to be cleared up in a hurry. Unless you want a lot of bad publicity. Oh, no, no. We'd rather that didn't happen. Good. Very well, Chief. I'll make my decision as quickly as possible. <laughs> Hurry up and get your uniform on, Frank. It's almost time for practice. I'll be ready, Bart. I was just thinking. About Doc Roberts again? Well, not exactly about Doc. But there was something I meant to check on last night, and in the excitement I forgot it. What was it, Frank? Did you see Herb Childs at the football rally? No, I don't believe I did come to think of it. Where was he? I wish I knew. All right, gang, let's get out on the field for practice. Hurry up and get dressed. The team's going out. I'll wait for you. All right, I'll only be a minute. But about Herb, don't you think it was odd for him to miss the rally? Well, do you think it has some connection with what happened last night? It might. I don't know. Wish I did. Why don't you ask Herb himself? Did he come to practice? I didn't see him. Oh, sure. He was one of the first ones out. He's on the field now, practicing kicking. Good. Let's ask him right away. talk to you a minute. Uh, sure thing. What's on your mind? You're a pretty close friend of Doc Roberts, aren't you? Oh, you know I am, Frank. And I feel awful about about what's happened. Then I know you won't mind if I ask you something that might be important. Uh, sure, sure. Where were you during the football rally last night? Oh, I was afraid you'd notice that. Don't you want to tell? Frank, I'm in a spot. I do want to tell, but I can't. I promised on my word that I wouldn't. Who did you promise? Well... It was Doc Roberts. I'm glad you could come along on such short notice, Enza. Hope I don't make you late for dinner. That's all right, Frank. I wouldn't mind missing dinner if I could help Doc Roberts. But what did you want me to do? Well, outside of Kirby, you're the only witness who could identify Doc as being at the scene of the crime. I think you should talk to him, too. They haven't arrested him yet, have they? No, Enza. So far, no formal charges have been pressed. 
You see, the dean just can't make himself believe that Doc would do a thing like that. Neither can I, in spite of all the evidence against him. That story you told me about Herb Childs worries me, though. Do you suppose Doc Roberts could be shielding him? Well, I thought of that, too, but I... I can't imagine Herb being guilty any more than Doc. That's one reason I want to get Doc's side of the story tonight. Mm, I wish I'd never seen that figure in the white sweater. I thought about it all afternoon while I was working at the athletic office. Say, hey, that's right. You have been at the athletic office all week, haven't you? Yes, the demand for tickets to the Dartmouth game has been so heavy, they needed help, and I volunteered. Why, Frank? Now, look, this may be important, Enza. Think hard. Did anything unusual happen there this week? Anything out of the ordinary? No, I don't think so. Wait, something did happen yesterday afternoon. Tell me everything you can remember about it. Don't leave out any detail. I'll try. There was no one in the office with me that afternoon, but Mr. Kirby and the student manager of the team... What's his name, Frank? Uh, Jack Mason. Oh, yes, Jack Mason. Well, all three of us were busy with the tickets when suddenly Mr. Kirby and Jack began to quarrel. Look here, Jack. You made another mistake in this column of figures. If you paid as much attention to your work as you do to your card games, you'd be a lot better off. Kirby, I'm getting sick and tired of your sanctimonious attitude. That's the third time today you've made a dig about my gambling. You've no business gambling, Mason, and you know it. You're just jealous because I happen to win most of the time. Winning has nothing to do with the case. You're setting a bad example for the other students. And as student manager of football, your actions should be above reproach. How does my gambling affect the other students? I never play with them. Well, gambling with the townies doesn't excuse you. It's still gambling. And if you keep it up, I'll be forced to report you to the authorities. You do, and you'll get the thrashing of your life. Look, Mason, I don't take threats like that from anyone. If you don't think I'm man enough to do it, Kirby, suppose we settle it right here. All right, I'm willing. You've had this coming to you for a long time. Uh, pardon me. Oh, uh, hello, Joe. Oh, it's Joe Nugent. Don't tell me you want to buy a ticket to the game, Joe. No, I, I uh, came uh, to stay only a minute. Have to get back to the station. There's a baggage train due in 15 minutes. What can we do for you? I just wanted to leave this note for you, Mr. Mason. It's uh, from a friend of yours. Oh? Let me see it. There may be an answer. Hmm. That's fine, Joe. Tell your friend I'm satisfied. I will, Mr. Mason. And thanks. Thanks a lot. And that's about all, Frank. Does it mean anything to you? It might mean a great deal, Enza. Jack Mason is the only person outside of Doc Roberts and Jim Kirby who has a key to the athletic office. I checked on it. Then you think that... I don't know yet, Enza. We'll know more after I've seen Jack Mason. But here's Doc Roberts' house. We'll talk to him first. No, Frank, I'm afraid I can't tell you any more than I've already told the police. Believe me, lad, I appreciate your interest, but my whereabouts that night are entirely my own affair. But, Doc, we're all sure you're innocent. You're shielding someone, aren't you? I know. No, of course not. I... Who could I be shielding? It could be Herb Childs. Herb Childs? Why did you mention him, Frank? Tell me, it's important. Frank noticed he wasn't at the football rally the night of the robbery, Mr. Roberts. And when I asked him about it, he refused to explain where he had been. So you noticed that, did you? I remember it was worrying, Frank, even before the robbery happened. You haven't mentioned this to the police, have you, Frank? No, no, of course not. Well, then don't. Herb had nothing to do with it, I assure you. I can tell you where he was, but you must promise not to tell anyone. All right, Doc, where was he? Herb is a hot-tempered lad, you know. A few days ago, he got into some sort of row with his economics professor and ran off to New York threatening to quit school. No. I didn't hear anything about that. No one knew about it but me. When I heard he had gone, I lit out after him to fetch him back before the authorities got wind of it. That's where I was the night of the robbery. In New York, persuading Herb to come back to New Haven with me. But that clears you of the crime, Doc. All you have to do is tell your story and you're free. Yes, yes, I'll be clear and Herb Childs will be suspended from school. Yeah, that's right. Never thought of that. And Herb is not only one of the best centers in the East, he's also a darn fine boy. I can't let him get into trouble no matter what happens. But why hasn't Herb told his story? I made him swear not to. At least until after the Dartmouth game. I told him the school was counting on him. Doc, you're a great man and you're not going to suffer for something you didn't do. Frank, you promised not to tell that story. Yes, but I didn't promise not to find the real thief. Maybe you can help. Do you recognize this paper? Let me see. Why, it's simply a crumpled newspaper. What about it? Do the numbers written on the margin mean anything to you? 740-1150-246-539-857. No, they mean nothing. What are they? They're not new football signals. Well, certainly not. I never saw them before. 
Where did you find that paper? Crumbled on the floor of your locker, Doc. What does it mean, Frank? I don't know about the numbers, but I think I have part of the answer. Doc, you're a pretty husky man. And the man you saw that night, Enzo, was husky too, wasn't he? Oh, yes. He filled out Mr. Robert's sweater, I remember. Exactly. He filled out the sweater because it was stuffed with newspapers to make him look like you, Doc. Well, I... But that means the man you're looking for has a slight build, Frank. That's right, Enzo. A build, for instance, like Jack Mason. But, Frank, you don't think Jack Mason's the bottom of this business, do you? I'll know more about that after I talk to him. But whoever's at the bottom of it... We've got to find him before they actually arrest you, Doc, and you're forced to tell the whole story about Herb Childs. wonder who that can be. Well, we'll be going anyway, Doc. Come along, Enzo. Goodbye, Mr. Roberts. Goodbye, and thanks a lot, both of you. Well, hello, Merriwell. Oh, it's Chief Burns. Huh? I hope you've given up playing detective, but it doesn't make much difference now. The case is closed. Closed? What do you mean? The dean has finally decided he must press charges. Doc, you're under arrest. Frank, what are you doing in the dorm so early? Bart, they finally placed Doc under formal arrest. Arrest? Then he's really guilty. He's no more guilty than you are. In fact, he can prove his innocence at any time. Then why doesn't he do it? I'll explain that to you later, Bart. It involves Herb Childs. Doc can't clear himself without getting Herb suspended. What? Well, that'd wreck the football team. That's one reason Doc doesn't want to talk. Bart, I've got to clear Doc of this charge, and the only way to do it is to find the real thief. Well, that's a pretty tall order. All the evidence points to Doc. Not quite. First, we know the thief got in with a key. Besides Doc, three other people have those keys. Who are they? Mr. Kirby, Dean Clark, and Jack Mason. Well, certainly neither Mr. Kirby or Dean Clark could be considered. And that leaves only... That's right, Bart. That leaves Jack Mason. I've got to talk to him tonight. We must work fast. Have you seen him? Oh, sure. Just a few minutes before you came. He was talking about an English theme with me. Where did he go? To his room, I suppose. Oh, no. No, wait. I... He said something about going down to the railroad station. He's not leaving town, is he? No. He said he wanted to go to see someone there. I see. All right, thanks, Bart. Enzo's waiting outside in the buggy. I'll go down and see him right now. Hey, Frank, wait for me. I'll go with you. The waiting room's deserted, Frank. I guess we missed him. I wonder where he could have gone. I don't know, but we better see what we can find out over at the ticket window. I just can't believe that Jack Mason could have the courage to do a thing like that. Do you really think you've got it solved, Frank? I think I've got most of the answers now. The only thing that bothers me are those numbers on the newspaper. Now, here's the ticket, Wendell. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Did a young man come in the waiting room here in the past 15 minutes? A Yale student, slight build, dark hair? Oh, you must mean Jack Mason. How did you know his name? Oh, he's been coming here quite often. You'll find him back there in the baggage room, more than likely. I see. Thank you. Not at all, young man. In the baggage room? What's he doing there, Frank? I think I know pretty well, Bart, but... Say! What is it, Frank? I think I've got it. Look at that train schedule up there on the blackboard. Well, what about it, Frank? Well, I don't see anything. Do you, Windsor? Nothing but the arrival time of the train. That's just it. Notice some of those times have check marks before them. According to the sign at the bottom, those are the trains that carry baggage. Yes, I see that. Well, read off the arrival times of trains carrying baggage. All right. 740, 1150, 246, 857. Frank, those numbers. Exactly, and so the same numbers that appeared on the margin of the newspaper. They were part of the train schedule. Well, I'll be done. And the ticket agent just said that Jack Mason spends a good deal of time down Not here. Not so fast, Bart. Let's talk to Jack first. Here's the baggage room. We'll see if he's in there. There he is, over there, talking to the baggage agent. I see him. Very well. What are you doing here? I came to have a little talk with you, Jack. Yeah? What about? Hey, you ought to know Bart, you... Bart, take it easy. Jack, you've been doing a bit of gambling lately, haven't you? That's my business. Maybe so, but a crime has been committed, and I think your gambling had something to do with it. You're crazy, Mary. Well, and if you're accusing me of stealing that money, you're barking up the wrong tree. He's got proof, Mason. Your game is up. I'm not accusing you, Jack. I just want to ask a question or two. What right have you got to question me? I don't have to account to you or anyone else except the dean. If he wants to know, let him ask me. What's going on here? Hello, Nugent. Do you remember me? Well, sure. You're Frank Merriwell. Everyone here in town knows you, I reckon. Merriwell's playing detective, Joe. He thinks I stole that money the other night. I still haven't accused you, Jack. I'm just trying to ask you a simple question. Yeah? What is it? On the afternoon before the robbery, you received a message from a friend here in town. How do you know? I told him, Mr. Mason. Perhaps you've forgotten that I was there in the office. Well? What of it? I'd like you to tell me what was in that message. That's none of your business, Merriwell. 
It had to do with a gambling debt, didn't it? I get it now. Mason stole that money to pay off a gambling debt, right? A good guess, Bart, but only a guess. There's one more thing I want to know. Joe, maybe you can help me with this. When is the next train due in carrying baggage? Baggage? Let me see. <laughs> I've got a trick memory, Mr. Merriwell. Got to write them down before I can recall them. Uh, 7.40, 11.50, 2.46... Ah, 857. That's your train. Thank you, Joe, and you're our man. What? What are you talking about, Mr. Merriwell? Look at that column of figures. Bart, Inza, do they check with the figures on this newspaper? What? Well, yes, they're the same. In the same handwriting, too, Frank. And if I'm not mistaken, Joe, you just paid Jack Mason a little gambling debt with that stolen money. Nugent, you didn't tell me you stole that money. All right. I admit it. I had to do it. But you'll never get me, Merriwell. Look out, Frank. That pile of trunks. You missed, Joe, but I won't. Boy, what a flying tackle. Ah. No gain, Joe. Now we'll talk to the police chief. Yes, Dean Clark. Joe Nugent's our man, all right. He's confessed. But, uh, very well, I don't see how you knew it. Well, I first suspected him right there in the athletic office the night of the robbery. Yeah. He came in about a half hour after the crime and said he'd been down at the station handling baggage on the 857 train. But that would be impossible. I was on that train and it was two hours late. Of course, Dean Clark and Joe knew it. He thought it would give him plenty of time to commit the robbery and pay off his gambling debt. Was there anything else? Yes, Chief, plenty. Inza told me about the note he brought to you, Jack, the afternoon before the crime. Yes, that was a note promising to pay me the money he owed. I guessed that. But the real reason for his visit was to steal a key to the office. But what about that newspaper with the train schedule on it, Murray Well, Why did Nugent leave a clue like that? That was an oversight, Chief. Huh? In his haste to change from Doc's sweater in the field house, he dropped the paper on the floor. He had that old newspaper along for padding, and he just happened to bring a newspaper he'd used to scribble out train schedules. You know he has a poor memory. Very shrewdly done, Mr. Merriwell, but now it's my turn. Yes, Dean Clark. You and Mr. Roberts went to great lengths to conceal the fact that a certain student, a Mr. Herb Childs, was absent from the campus without proper authority. Then, then you knew about that. I'm sure your motives were unimpeachable. I've been apprised of the situation by the professor in question and by Mr. Childs himself, and I'm inclined to be lenient with him uh, this time. Then, Herb, Mr. Childs will be able to play tomorrow? I've given him a warning instead of a suspension. Oh, that's wonderful, Dean Clark. The team needs Herb. I'm glad you approve, Mr. Mason. May I remind you that your gambling activities merit you a suspension? Yes, sir, I know. I didn't realize when I started, but I've sworn off now. Well, I believe you, Mr. Mason. If I did not, I should have you expelled. As it is, I'm letting you off with a warning. In the future, conduct yourself as a real Yale man. Yes, sir, I will. And thank you, sir. Well, I guess that winds up the affair for me. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, Merriwell... Uh, yes, Chief Burns? I know I warned you to stay out of this business, but I'm glad now that you didn't. And if you can crack that Dartmouth line like you cracked this case... <laughs> Son, I'm betting on Yale. <laughs> another exciting adventure with Frank Merriwell, beloved hero of American fiction, brought to you in a new series of dramatic stories by the National Broadcasting Company. Be with us again next week at the same time when Frank Merriwell returns in another of his celebrated exploits. Today's script is by Ruth and Gilbert Braun and was produced and directed by Joe Mansfield. The Adventures of Frank Merriwell stars Lawson Zerby and features Hal Studer and Gene Gillespie. Music is by John Winters. It's wacky. It's the new NBC morning madcap show, Lee Sullivan's Best Pocket Varieties, 
Heard over most of these stations at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday through Friday. Listen this week for the true story of Matilda Girdleshrink. Listen for the Philharmonic Five, the Smoothies, a true story of scientific adventure in three-headed zebra land, and that astounding classic feature, serial music. You'll have fun with the star of Espaca Varieties, Lee Sullivan and his happy sidekicks, Florence McMichaels and Frank Maxwell. So don't miss this sensational new gimmick-studded show, Vest Pocket Varieties. Heard at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time over most of these stations every morning, Monday through Friday. We'll be listening. How about you? Tex Antoine speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Thank you.